I'm George Yule, author of Quantum Theory of Time. This is the first lecture on the theories of time. Time is the object of study in physics. You know the equation is physics by a time derivative. Time is a physically functional dimension. Understanding time helps us understand physics generally. As a teacher, it was never my habit to exactly repeat what is in any book, even when I wrote it. There are things I left out that are in the book, and things here that aren't in the book. These are meant to complement each other, not replace each other. Now, let's get on with it. Placeholders like this are here to help navigate the outline. Following the problem, we will examine these points. In 1921, Cummings published his story, The Time Professor. In it, the professor echoes a basic concept from relativity. Time is what prevents everything from happening at once. Einstein first framed things locally in time, then moved them around in time. Then he proved it is functional with general relativity. In relativity, time does things by controlling the scale. The scale is the value of one. By controlling scale, time resists the spread of things, specifically space and change. Resistance alone is passive, so too is space being flat and entropy being curved. The active part applies when these are put into their opposite contexts. When space is curved into local position, something has to prevent it from unfolding and fluctuating like an unleashed leaf spring, spreading value away. That something is time. The quantum theory of time is vastly different from anything you conceived as time, yet it literally follows the application of time throughout the familiar physics. Correspondence with familiar and well-established physics is a basic principle of quantum mechanics. We will talk about the principles later in this video. Without them, we won't be able to make sense of time. People assume that time is a strict progression of cause to effect, but actually, from a non-linear, non-subjective viewpoint, it's more like a big ball of wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey stuff. Yeah, I've seen this bit before. You said if a maze automatically seizes your brain, don't feel bad. I had to write a script just to get past this. Like a maze, time is a showstopper. We want to just climb up into it, start where we are told, and end where we are told. Basically, the wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey ball of stuff. Which end of this is the beginning, anyway? And why can't we find our way out from the middle? We like to think of time on a clock, a calendar, or stopwatch. These are just relative measures. A ruler is a measure of space. But we don't confuse the ruler with space being measured. Likewise, a clock measures time, but it is not actually time. The literature allegedly covering the physics of time has forgotten the actual physics. Einstein is a major contributor to that physics. He is somewhere in the middle of the maze. Newton, ironically, is at the start of our pursuit and still ahead of most studies. Most everyone is stuck on confusing a clock with time. It's what we use to calculate. The line through the maze provides a valid sequence connecting one opening of the maze to the other. Every point on that line is a valid perspective. Most of the maze goes nowhere. It distracts us. How long each person takes is another story. There is a scale issue on top of the path issue. We will come back to the scale issue. The path issue is uncertainty. That, too, is a time function. Whenever we limit ourselves to observation and computation, we also limit ourselves to a deterministic perspective. Since Newton, time has been quantum mechanical. I don't just say that to sound clever. It is untidy. It has free and deterministic parts. Rudolf Clausius is the father of the second law of thermodynamics and entropy. The second law is an evolution of Newton's original force equals mass times acceleration. Clausius developed his ideas over the space of about three decades. Early in his work, he said the energy of the world is constant and entropy always increases. This is where the popular notion of the arrow of time comes from.
Later, we will see how time function that this is not where the arrow comes from. We know now that entropy is a form of energy. As such, these two statements contradicted each other. There's also the minor matter of ice machines. Clearly, entropy can go both ways. In 1873, he devised Virial theorem to show angular momentum reduces entropy. There are other effects also, but entropy is not our concern at the moment. He replaced the original second law with what you learned in grade school. Energy flows from high to low potential. In context, here we will see this as a real change applies into available time. Since Newton created the science of physics, the object of study has been time. Velocity is a time derivative of position. The dot notation is Newton's notation. Each d represents a measure on an axis. X and T are axes. A position is any point along them. With D, you connect two points on an axis to have a length or a duration. The denominator increments the numerator. The larger the denominator, the smaller the increments of space. With velocity, these values change because things like their positions. They resist change. Functions of the field do not resist change. Their effects have constant rates. Speed has a range of effect rather than a distance. It is already a length per unit time. Velocity is messy because it relates to acceleration. Acceleration generalizes velocity by doing another time derivative. The second time derivative applies the surface of, the cha of change within a surface of time onto position. To understand a time surface, we need to go back to Newton's definitions. Let's get this book off the shelf and read from it on page six. This copy right here, page six, top of the page. He said, well, in Latin, it's been translated. Absolute true in mathematical time of itself and from its own nature flows equably without regard to anything external and by another name is called duration. Realize, of course, he is struggling with words here because, you know, he's at the onset of this. Relative, apparent, and common time is some sensible and external, whether accurate or, er, or an equable measure of duration by the means of motion, which is commonly used instead of true time such as an hour, a day, a month, or a year. So he's a little bit confused here. Absolute space in its own nature, without regard to anything external, remains always similar and immovable. Relative space is some movable dimension or measure of the absolute spaces which are our senses determined by its position to bodies, and which is vulgarly taken for immovable space. Such is the dimension of a subterraneous, an aerial, or celestial space determined by its position in respect of the Earth. And he goes on and on and on. He's juggling with words here, trying to make sense of things. <clears throat> Let's frame these definitions in more contemporary terms, following his line of reasoning and simplifying his language. First, his absolute axis is just the axis into which value is then applied. He thought it was beyond measure, but Einstein put it into a local perspective and treated it as a unit axis. His framing is completely separate from this absolute axis. So you can think of the absolute axis as a function of the field, and Einstein's framing idea where he takes that function of the field and applies unit value and adjust that unit value to scale as framing. So you got two different concepts of time here, not competing, mind you, but in parallel, they work together. In relativity, the size of that unit scale uh, acts as the mechanism for gravity. 
Relative time is the symbol measure between points on the axes made with rulers and clocks. That basically what Newton is doing is he says, here is an axis. It goes on, you know, forever, every which direction. And I take a sample out of it from here to here. That's my duration of time. Just like he does the same thing with space. <clears throat> Absolute space is a virtual axis also. A virtual axis is a useful emptiness. It's, it's not actually doing anything. Like the emptiness of a cup, it is a value of nothing. Nothing is actually something and it is conserved. A real value is exactly conserved, meaning you can follow and must follow its changes directly. So it's like pouring water from a glass into a bowl. You, you can literally follow the value of the water as it's going from one thing to the next. Now, a virtual value, on the other hand, is conserved in proportion. So let's say you add entropy to an ice cube and the atoms within that ice cube now become more excited and they push it apart and they change their state to liquid. Now, by doing this, what they've done is they have changed a proportion of a virtual axis. The virtual axis is the one that says, when I push on the ice cube, the whole ice cube moves. Well, when I added real entropy into that, I voided that. I made it so that the virtual axis is now applied to the local atoms. So that now when I push on it, I'm pushing on the individual atoms with some collective stickiness among them. Virtual value is potential. It's a container. It can't do work or be measured directly. Real value can be directly measured and does work. Work can be many things, including the value of a position or acting on position. It also propagates because, again, it is exactly conserved. Einstein's relativity wasn't entirely news. The physics community was ready for it. Well, sort of. Time scale in space still confuses people. It doesn't change the value, it changes how the value is measured. Changing the value of one creates a difference in potential. He showed space-time does things with gravity in general relativity. In this book, we will examine how space-time is assembled and transforms among different states of energy. In 1905, Einstein published a series of papers. One of these was on the electrodynamics of bodies in motion. In it, he describes a non-inertial frame as linear, not rotating, or cyclic. Evidently, he assumed this was good enough. By implication, what was excluded from non-inertial applies to the inertial. An inertial frame is curved into local focus. By curving it into focus, he's saying each thing, you know, the book, for instance, is it contained by its own time, just as my hand is contained by its own time. And these two things are separated in time, by time. It is here we find the map of specific things as inertial positions in the context of a higher order of position. Einstein's framing describes the effects of time on position. Newton's absolute axis describes time as a function of the field. It is from the field that the surface of time comes together to establish position. Now we have two perspectives to the same ambiguous concept. Newton's absolute axis divides into two rules. The first is eternity. Now eternity predates him just slightly by some uh, monks who were debating, trying to figure out, can there be a first person? Well, when you look at each person being born and living and dying on their own schedule, well, that kind of puts a mess on things, so you end up with this abstract concept of eternity. Eternity is the axis of changes without beginning or end. It is infinity. Every life or other form of creation is on its own schedule, having its own duration. You cannot destroy what is not created. So eternity is the ultimate container describing the entire universe of finite energy and things, including the Big Bangs and every other form of creation. 
Thanks to a better understanding of time and following the applied science, Big Bang processes will be relatively easy to explain when we get to them without speculation when we get to them in a few chapters. The second axis we normally think of as space, but look again at the scale. Distance on the maps of the universe is given in light years. That simple ruler only works from where we are in the top of this picture directly to a point. It also only works for light, not an actual ruler that is light years long. This system was developed by Bessel in 1836 when he established a distance solution. It is called the Stellar Parallax Solution because he used positions in our orbit to triangulate and accurately measure the distance to a star. The change in time measured is, of course, relative. Now we have two time axes that can be handled as absolute or relative, plus we have framing. One axis is the sequence of change we normally think of as time. It is along eternity that we arbitrarily set our clocks to give us reference to measured durations. We can use a stopwatch to the same effect. The other axis is the map we normally call space. This is not the physical dimension of space, but rather the idea of difference between things. We don't have a difference among things without inertial frames to contain them. Time is very untidy. We think in broad generalizations, especially when it comes to ultra fundamental concepts of like time, space, and entropy. Where space and entropy are real and can do work, time distinguishes them from each other. Eternity contains the universe, so we can say the background we take for granted is time. Einstein recognized time is imaginary, but what does that mean? Whenever we limit ourselves to observation and computation, we also limit ourselves to a deterministic perspective. Since Newton, time has been quantum mechanical. We just didn't realize it. I don't just say that to sound clever. It is untidy. It has free and deterministic parts, both. We can't just treat it one way. The traditional imaginary number is i, the square root of negative one. We, this is a functional unit, but what's in this functional unit? Now, consider the line of value we would label x, since it is a real length. This line of value is the trunk of an x mystery, and I say that quite intentionally as x mystery. Our x mystery is missing everything we'd want to convert it into a Christmas tree. All we have is a length. What about its shape, its branches, and needles? These are a degree of qualities beyond the real value. These qualities are imaginary in that they provide a very different perspective from the length and thereby give a quality to that length. Imaginary does not mean to imply it doesn't exist or is just a function of the mind. It does make the quality dependent on a real context to be observed and measured. Combining the local perspective of the trunk with the general perspective of its qualities is what gives us the Christmas tree. Or in this case, shows the proper abbreviation should arguably be z tree. Now, the y tree without the x tree is just a mess on the ground. So, If i is the imaginary operator for distribution and qualities added, then j is the imaginary operator for position. I and J combine to form a third imaginary number, H, all three of which, their squares, are negative one. From H, we can generalize time. Let's see how that works. First, we have the map of time describing our local positions in the same moment along the sequence of eternity. J has some unique qualities, starting with being a logical plus or minus. Now, the map doesn't distinguish direction from distance, but we do. Plus, in this context, context, sorry, contracts the field adding into position. So when I say plus in this context, it is coming to me. With Newton's law of gravity, the same effect is shown with a negative because he is reducing elevation. So he's coming from here and he's going negative rather than adding to position. It's all a matter of perspective, how that plus or minus is added in there. 
A negative here takes away from position, distributes from the field. Or it can describe the same path from the opposite perspective. If we combine the journey to with the journey from, essentially, we negate the whole journey. J plus J equals zero. It's like we didn't go anywhere. Each operation reverses the signs on J. So the square of J is negative one. Each operation of J is an opposite but local perspective. If we subtract J minus J, then the second J is in the original perspective. The traveler goes to the destination, then comes back and counts the entire journey. The perspectives suggest time is reversible. This operator generalizes both directions. Like the odometer in a car, it doesn't matter which way you go, the length is measured the same way both ways. Next, we apply that length both ways at the same time in opposite directions from the position as logical and from my perspective to yours, counterclockwise, rotate. This is for distribution around a position. So this length rotates to describe a circle of equal and opposite effects, that is I. Now, this is for distribution around position. So this length rotates to describe a circle of equal and opposite effects in, in counterclockwise direction. We know it as I, and I squared is negative one. We also know that I plus I is two I. So we know that I flips its signs on multiples. When it flips signs, it changes its direction of rotation. And instead of distributing this way, it's going to create focus going the other way. But that's another story for a later chapter. Distribution is a function of change. So I here is the sequence of time. When we combine the squares of I and J, we get double the square of H. H is nature's system of feedback, at least on the most elementary level. You cannot distinguish one part of it from the other as they are in perfect complement. For those of you paying close attention, notice that j plus j equals zero means the root of the sum of the squares of i and j is i plus j. We will have a lot of fun with these complex operators much later. Now let's apply these in classical ways. i and j are both unit operators, so they already provide a degree of quantity to change. Velocity is now simply the distance measure of x held to its position by the J operator. Likewise, speed is the range held in its distribution by the I operator. Velocity is variable, and the only way to apply that variability is to actually subject it to another change condition. Without I, J is doing nothing. It is inert, and vice versa. By asserting J, we now have more than a local extent we now have a duration of change as a sequence being applied to that context. If velocity is a time derivative of position, then the derivative is adding a specific change operator. Acceleration is then another time derivative adding a different change operator. And by change operator, I'm referring to i, j, and h. By doing this, they complement each other and invoke action. I know it's weird to say, but velocity isn't doing anything without another time dimension. Propagation isn't doing anything either, at least until it distributes to positions. Yes, I know this is a tad confusing. Let's not linger on the precipice of madness and take a quantum leap off the deep end into the abstract. We've been talking about the value of one. Well, what about the value of zero? Nobody ever thought about that, did they? Well, William Clifford did. Nothing is a terribly useful concept. It is the emptiness of a thing that can be used, and this is literally the low potential of the second law. When to apply value and the degree to not apply value are pretty important to a functional universe. William Crawford devised an operator called a dual number that handles the value of zero. He did this in conjunction with quaternions similar to HIJ just described, except his quaternions that he was working with were Hamiltonian quaternions, I, J, K. We will also cover those much later. We will conversely use dual numbers to build 
basic quaternions from scratch. Yes, that will be later, so don't panic yet. That's much later, in fact. But for now, we're simply dealing with the concept of emptiness and an operator defining it and giving us the concept of low potential for value to flow into. In algebra, you are introduced to the difference between real and imaginary on a very abstract level. We just change that significantly to show at least how two imaginary operators apply local and general qualities. Crawford and the success of uh, algebra following him is highly abstract. Let's make it accessible by putting it in concrete terms. First, the cup is a local real perspective. Its usefulness is the emptiness inside of it, the extent of that nothing, giving it potential to do something. This extent of nothing is a virtual space. A real space is local and real, like the cup. It is also exactly conserved, so you can and must follow its changes directly, as we already discussed. A virtual space is proportionally conserved. Now, by proportional conservation, I mean basically this. If I take an object like this mouse, for instance, and I apply pressure to it to cause it to move, okay, I force, I should say, to cause it to move, I am acting on a virtual axis. Without that virtual axis, I can't act on this thing, okay? If I apply too much entropy to this, then this solid becomes a liquid, and when I try to apply force to it, well, the proportion of this virtual space has shifted to the role of acting with the atoms. So now instead of pushing on the mouse as a whole, I would be pushing on the atoms who are now somewhat sticky with each other and will sort of follow each other, but it won't be the whole at once. That's how proportional conservation works with virtual space. As I take the entropy away, that virtual space shifts roles again from local to the more general role of the mouse. Let's define the virtual space as a real extent of nothing. Nothing is defined by a matrix whose square is zero. It has only one value strategically placed in it to describe its, its extent, <coughs> B in this case. Every two by two matrix is essentially a relationship between perspectives. This matrix is simply saying that all but one of those perspective elements is zero. It also says we can't double down on nothing. We can't take a nothing and then form a nothing within that nothing. Something must frame nothing for nothing to be useful. Otherwise, it's a useless nothing. Virtual potential is a low potential. We can fill it with imaginary value. Here, the imaginary value gives quality by filling with an unknown quantity. The quantity is real, but its quality is not. This combination is a complex variable. It is shown as a big outline Z. If you're looking for how to create these special letters, look in your font dialog box for the outline checkbox. Now let's put some physics teeth in this. Clausius defined potential as the total energy. In our context, it is the extent nothing is something. Something can have work done on it or by it. The relationship of the potential to work is the change unit. The change unit is a dependent variable in an open system. In thermodynamics, this variable then applies as an independent variable. It modifies by applying itself as a scaling increment within the relationship of temperature to entropy and surface to volume describing the closed perspective of a system. Again, this is a topic for a later chapter. Our point here is to show how these concepts lead one into the other. While the units here are in joules of energy, the active element is time resisting spread. By altering the unit, we have changed the context of the otherwise closed system. The system is closed by gauge theory. Gauge theory is what we use to describe stable matter. It doesn't transform through local operations. The real cup is labeled R. It is counted as work value along with complex content Z. They are both real in different perspectives. Putting Z into R or taking Z from R does not change the nature of either, at least in this context. The increment here 
is a proportion identified by a lowercase delta. It looks like a D with a squiggly handle. The proportion of these increments changes the unit. The ratio of the values going into U forms one of three triangle types. Each triangle type relates to, you guessed it, an imaginary operator with complex effect on the shape and direction of focus. Again, these will be covered much in much later chapters. So, Let's start with the part of the spectrum we are most familiar with. Relativistic light includes all light emitted by the energy level changes of electrons and the effect on those emissions as they become free energy. There is an entire chapter dedicated to how propagation works. For now, our concern is again the use of nothing. Each emission consists of lines of energy levels called the Balmer series. The series for input is opposite that of the series for output. The output looks like a vast expanse of nothing with small narrow lines. Those lines are real value framed by a specific pattern of, you guessed it, nothing. They are broadened by the heat of the source causing specific parts to move in different directions at different rates. This level of information is again a measure of a degree of something versus, <clears throat> I know, you got it, nothing. <laughs> We're mastering nothing here, aren't we? I labeled this T plus S sigma, so you can see this will eventually play out to a temperature causing linear thermal expansion. It is propagating by distributing, redistributing, sorry, the angular effect of virtual entropy to the field, which is made possible by applying real value to local positions. This effectively separates the container from what it contains. It causes the energy density to be lost due to a concept known as Huygens Fresno principle. This principle basically says light fills in behind and it explains shadows. So, what it says is that when you have light encountering an obstacle, every point along that surface acts like it's the start of the surface of light and it just carries on, it fills in from there. It also explains redshift by conforming to the field and the loss of focus without losing the original energy identity. This principle only applies to the relativistic segment of the spectrum. As we shift our perspective to the left on the spectrum, we lose the capacity for information in specific photons. Gamma rays don't have any information. They are just lines of value being excluded. As a gamma ray unfolds, it loses energy to things in its direct path, enabling it to widen, then fill onto a surface, then into a volume. The relativistic light then picks up from there and as overflow, as a curved surface, flattening towards equilibrium. Equilibrium is another untidy topic. It is still a matter up for debate in physics, but it's really not that hard if you can follow the logic. It depends on the context, and there are layers of context within context. Equilibrium ultimately is where long waves cancel with background temperature in the form of CMB. Opposite to gamma rays being excluded are long waves being manufactured by group dynamics like charge interactions. These waves are general work value describing real entropy. Real entropy is what drives things apart to convert a solid to a liquid to a gas. And if you push out the real entropy through charge interactions or using the virial theorem and its angular momentum uh, dynamics, you drive away the real entropy and you reverse that process so that you can change a gas to a liquid to a solid. For these waves, the information pattern is a virtual space. Instead of smoothing and flattening the surface as we saw with light, these waves break down into smaller, more curved wavelets. This signal loss increases their energy perspective, but that perspective is a dual number. Yes, that means it is increasing its receptivity to real energy, or I should say thermal energy, space. When it is at the same level as real temperature, the two waves cancel into a standing spherical wavefront. 
these real values are then the plus and minus B modes in CMB. The virtual axes also cancel and generalize to the E mode. E mode is just the available scale effect of useful nothingness. This combination is what we can call free space. All its value is creating a useful emptiness that has no directional effect on motion or propagation. It is also available to be focused into the material processes by massive celestial objects. B mode is ambiguous because when you look at the real value axes from different perspectives, they change. This is known as anisotropy. While I was describing this, your brain should be looking at these tissues as either face up or face down. Most of us start with face down and mentally flip them over. Our minds flip perspectives for us. Of course, the B modes are more like the actual dishes put into a random context. Some are up, some are down. The arrangement flips over when you switch directions to look. Earlier, I mentioned three triangle types leading into different logics. One axis of each triangle is a real work value. If it is flat, it is trying to unfold. If it is curved, it is trying to unfold. This pattern translates into details defining two different ways to handle three triangle types, each a logic for interaction, creating ultimately six logical interactions. Subjected to a vast celestial object like Earth or the Sun, these logics get framed, interact, and simplify to form matter. That process is known of as transmutation. This is the free energy going into a process of perturbation. Perturbation means simplifying by excitement. The excitement in this case is focus in motion. This picture is called a gradient. It is a flat representation of three-dimensional information. The pattern of galaxies is provided by the interference of long waves on local background temperature. The pattern is called baryonic acoustic oscillation because the E-mode effect giving this B-mode shape is similar to sound. Keeping this E-mode shaping pattern in mind, we come back to our map. The distance from where we are to another point on the map is measurable by a ruler fitting the path light has traveled. When we get there and turn around, that distance will be different because the field has changed. Ah, how annoying is that, right? We're still, the distance between things in our field of view is really just the angle. Hubble said galaxies are on average 2 million light years apart, but in reality, all we can be sure of is the angle. There's nothing wrong with this measure so long as we recognize the issue of scale in the field. The further away we look, the harder it is to be exact with our measure between things. The field and light are highly deceptive. Light has no self-control. When it passes its redshift horizon at z equals 1, it is now completely unreliable. I don't pick words to sound clever or sell copies. Quantum mechanics is critical to putting time theories together into a concept we can meaningfully wrap our heads around and use. Quantum mechanics was made possible by the greatest failure of a great mind. Max Planck came into physics when physics was convinced of its completeness. Such arrogance, and of course him being a good science scientist, required that, well, of course, he had to break it. His greatest successes were black body radiation, energy equivalence of the field, which he got a Nobel Prize for, and failing to quantize units. In school or on the internet, you may have already encountered the so-called Planck units. <clears throat> he computed these using constants. His goal was to quantize the units separately. Problem is, when you change the equations, the numbers change too. What he actually did was prove that classical determinism doesn't explain how the universe works. In other words, there can be no classical quantum theory because the universe doesn't quantize that way. He had failed, and in science, a failure can be an open door to an all-new great adventure. Planck was the wrecking ball, clearing the field for quantum mechanics to step in with a totally different methodology. Einstein described quantum mechanics very concisely with his criticism that God does not play dice. God is omniscient, and to solve a problem scientifically, you need full control of the variables. 
problem solving strives for deterministic answers, but understands that reality throws curveballs. In practice, we observe and compute using the deterministic solutions subject to the probability that the solution applies. The reality is uncertainty. We don't always have full control of variables, so strays can throw things off. In school, we're taught the solutions, how to manipulate, do studies, and compute probabilities. We cannot teach problem solving. Problem solving is a state of mind. We can open that door in that direction, but you have to walk through it. As Planck was crashing and burning, a young up upstart named Niels Bohr entered the scene with some really crazy ideas. I know he's old in the picture. It happens to the best of us. I mean, look at me. Bohr took an interest in atoms, electrons, and the emission of light. He devised explanations for atoms that are still taught in school, <laughs> much to his dismay. In fact, even in his, in his life, the one thing that irked him was teaching his outdated theories. Kind of funny, because they're still being taught. He also solved the Rydberg problem, explaining the Balmer series of lines on the spectrum. He had a huge problem working with atoms. Atoms have an array of measurable qualities. I mean, here, let me grab this and show you. Open up to any page and you see a whole array of different qualities. Well, each one of those qualities <laughs> has its own mechanism. And if you try to put them all together, as separate things, then you have more than there can possibly be for the atom. Well, obviously, those things are all true. So people finding these things and figuring out their mechanism doesn't mean that one answer is replacing another answer. Science is into competition. So he realized something we take for granted, and that is that each individual simultaneously fills multiple roles. I'm a son, a father, a grandfather, a friend, a citizen, I've been an employee, you know, an uncle, and so on. We fill all of these roles, and each of these roles has its own, like, mechanism to it. Well, obviously, all those mechanisms fit in with me, so they do work together. And to some extent, they work against each other. This concept is called complementarity. <clears throat> now, another way to look at this is to break open a dictionary to any definition. My favorite <laughs> is work. <clears throat> I know, I keep reaching back here for books. Why not? Right? Work. Now, work has dozens of definitions, and honestly, I'm pretty sure it's the longest definition uh, in, in the dictionary, but I could be wrong. I, I could indeed be wrong. Uh, the basic word work here starts here and keeps going and keeps going. And then it picks up on its its secondary things partway down the next page. Now, we understand that all of these definitions are true relative to context. And if you're a poet, you try to maximize on this <clears throat> by leaving out enough context that people can bring in their own. And that way when they look at a, a set of words making up a poem, they get a, a, an image out of that that is uniquely theirs. This is an important skill to becoming a quantum mechanic, so don't overlook what happens in other classes or life generally. Physics is reality. So if you're ignoring some part of reality and just focusing too much on your study of physics, you're going to miss a lot. Like the poet, the universe maximizes its use of everything, and for that matter, nothing. 
Complementarity is a basic principle not to be confused with wild ideas like the multiverse theory, for instance. That's great comic book thinking, but it is not complementarity. The next principle is correspondence principle. Everything must correspond with empirically confirmed results or lead to them. This is where the multiverse theory idea goes completely off the rails because there's no empirical path leading into this. There are no results. There's no observation of it. And there's no reproducibility to it. So there's no correspondence. It isn't science. We have to be careful of that because we speculate a lot and pretend that it's science, but speculation isn't science. Science is reproducible, always reproducible. If you can't reproduce it, it ain't science. It's speculation. We can't make things up as we go along and there aren't alternate realities. Sorry, hate to spoil the fun. Uncertainty separates one perspective from another. Each perspective has its own take on reality, but that is about processing relative to perspective, not alternate realities. With Copenhagen interpretation in 1927, Werner Heisenberg is credited with his uncertainty principle. This is typically interpreted as the change in momentum and position cannot be simultaneously known. More intuitively, it says, you in a local position cannot relate to a function of the field and vice versa. The two are disconnected by uncertainty. You as an individual cannot relate your household budgeting to national policies. They are vastly different perspectives. Mathematically, it says the change in position and change in momentum are greater than or equal to half of a unit spin. If it is equal, it is local and close. If it is greater, then it is open as a function of the field. Uncertainty and entropy are often confused with information and chaos. Uncertainty is just that. We don't or can't know. I put my hand out into the unknown. On the other side can be air or clay. Either way reacts an equal and opposite way fitting its nature. The reaction is its own interpretation of my hand. It then continues on to do its own thing. When light reaches its horizon and experiences wave collapse, it changes its perspective. Wave collapse loses information. The change in perspective replaces that information with new information from another perspective. Yes, we can in a thought experiment know all the details at each stage and see how they transition into each other. And by doing that, we can formulate it and explain it mathematically. We can't know in reality. We can only know when the chips are down and we can settle all the variables deterministically. Yes, I do cover this in the book where determinism ends and freedom begins in the relative margin of error and how to compute where that decimal place lands so that you know where freedom begins. Another way to think of uncertainty is in the application of momentum. Consider, for example, a momentum of eight kilogram meters per second. Now, we consider context. Each unit and combination of units provides a valid context. When we apply real value to an available potential, that potential limits how value applies. Is it one kilogram at eight meters per second or eight kilograms at one meter per second? Are there two meters? In a quarter of a second, we cannot know which combination of values to these axes will apply in a particular context until it is applied. This is only because each axis and the scalar giving value are generalizations. I cannot explain why uncertainty principle was not expanded to follow through with how perspectives relate to each other. Perhaps they were thinking we'd fill in the gap with an existing solution. So we'll do that. The solution is known as a Jacobi rotation. This is a popular solution taking on many forms, including the metric tensor, S matrix, and the weak mixing matrix, to name a few.
We start with a polar graph background. On it, we see two perspectives labeled I for generalization and J for local, respectively. They are connected by a line of rotation. As I follow this rotation, I lose local perspective as a function of cosine. I'm losing focus to the field as a function of the sign shown by the blue line. Eventually, I reach wave collapse at the quarter angle. The quarter angle is at half the energy distribution. At this point, I lose my local perspective. A degree of the effect nested between sine and cosine becomes a background function of a greater whole. I can measure shift by the virtual degree of entropy affecting the real value. The virtual axis changes as the tangent line between the perspectives. Clausius originally linked this to tangent and entropy, but we want to avoid confusion, so we should drop the word entropy out of this part. We will have an entire chapter on entropy explaining the theories of entropy. That's the next chapter, by the way. The virtual axis for light is Z, measuring redshift by the change of energy to the observed energy. The tangent inverse gives us the angle to apply to our observation to see which perspective and to what degree that perspective applies. By setting up our axes this way, we can further see how the imaginary operators work and relate to familiar functions. We also see that the virtual axis links directly to a generalization of the time surface. We can show this another way by transposing a triangle, then shifting the observer's view, or for that matter, just taking a triangle and rotating it, because as you rotate it at a certain point, you will not be able to distinguish one side from the other. In this case, as the observer rotates, they gradually observe the out-of-focus perspective. This perspective takes over when the local and general perspectives become indistinguishable. Now the only thing the observer can see from their level of perspective is the more general effect. As previously described, this can be expressed in the form of a 2x2 two two matrix. Here, x is a local unit, y is a general unit, and x is measured by cosine, y is measured by sine. As you shift perspective, value is lost to local and gain to general. And of course, we can swap these with sine and cosine or the logical operators for the units of any size. Uncertainty makes a big mess of these matrices as you technically lose both perspectives in the middle. We can apply this concept to the so-called particle horizon to illustrate proper and conformal time differences using uncertainty principle. In classical reasoning, the annihilation of a proton will propagate all the way to the end of the spectrum without incidentally hitting the equilibrium in the middle to form CMB. Frequency is a measure of energy in terms of time. We can use uncertainty to show the difference between light's experience of time and how far light propagated in time. Your experience of time is proper time. Conformal time is the actual time you went through. If you are moving fast enough to measure dilation, then your clock is slower than the clock of a stationary observer. Your experience of time is thus at a slower rate due to your motion. It is your proper time. Light experiences time by shifting phase with distribution. Phase is where you can find the energy level on the spectrum. This phase shift is its personal experience and therefore its sense of proper time. Conformal time is how far that light actually traveled while it experienced phase shift. In these functions, I converted the terms to circular functions using identities. I then converted the circular functions to just their axes, with proper time being local and conformal being general. Finally, I simplified and plugged in a number. Now that number is a hypothetical n of the spectrum defined by a set of constants. It is only hypothetical, it is not an actual n. It gives 1.836 billion years to a proper time and 46.14 billion years to a conformal time. That is very near to the 46 and a half billion light years cosmology gives it. Again, this is a hypothetical and not how light actually works. 
It actually generalizes many times over. Each time it resets phase and generalizes with other values, basically piggybacking to equilibrium in the middle. In the propagation chapter, we will talk more about how light from opposite ends of the spectrum propagates towards the middle of the spectrum, not the end. Time is an assemblage of three interconnected concepts, each dividing into two perspectives. The first is Newton's absolute time representing boundless spread as a function of the field. Using time to measure distance to stars and galaxies helps split the absolute time concept between the sequence of changes and its application as a map of the present. The map and sequence are not their content. They are eternity, the container we call the universe. The logics of these absolute perspectives are what set the arrow of time following the sequence of change with no regard to the direction of change. The absolute axes generalize onto the surface of time from which we can now establish positions. Positions are the finite content of the universe subject to being created, transformed, and destroyed. Special relativity describes a unit. That unit frames position, where red is the map function of the field, cyan is anti-red, being a closed unit function of position. Such a closed unit is an inertial position describing an extent in the present. It includes cyclic motions that contain the position, not only as a point on the map, but also in the sequence of changes. Blue is a function of the field. Anti-blue is yellow, shown here as almost orange so you can see it. It is a function of an open, non-inertial position. This can be applied to an existing inertial frame or be a position unto itself, as with neutrinos. As a position, a non-inertial frame is a probability on the map along a linear path of change. The position is a segment of the sequence of time containing that path. It is open, so changes to the path will change the nature of the identity. Relativity highlighted several things, including the value of one and time being a functional mechanism. It also highlights the concept of relative time measuring a sample or extent between two positions, or multiple positions for that matter. Real values we can follow exactly. There are two types of measure. The first are real. We can observe and follow these exactly. They are convenient and may even politely consist of a simple count of multiple positions. Useful emptiness is measured using what are called dual numbers. This is like measuring the empty space in a cup. Dual number values are the differences where real values can go and distinguish one real from another. As useful emptiness, they are a great way to describe low potential. Low potential is the mechanism of every version of the second law. By understanding time, we will understand physics and our place in the physical universe. Be sure to like and subscribe. Buy the book, of course, and please leave a review. Thank you.